So we'll start the, the second lecture of this morning. So it's quite a different <coughs> subject. It's Leçon sur les hypothèses cosmogoniques, Poincaré's view of solar system formation, what remains valid today by Alessandro Morbidelli. Please. Thank you and thank you very much for this invitation. It's an honor for me to be here in this meeting and honor the memory of Poincaré. So I will speak about this book, Leçons sur les hypothèses cosmogoniques. So essentially it's origin on uh, hypotheses and models uh, lectures on hypotheses and models on origins. Uh, Poincaré gave a series of lectures on origins at the University of La Sorbonne. And actually, the book is not written by him. It's written by Henri Vergne on the basis of Poincaré's lecture notes. But Vergne is essentially just a scriber. And uh, when you read the book, it's uh, essentially Poincaré speaking and Vergne is, uh, is, is not at all showing up. So Poincaré was a mathematician, was not uh, an astronomer, so he doesn't really have his own theories. So in this book, it's like a broad review of the models and the theories of the time that Poincaré describes with his uh, mathematician touch. So he brings, he describes all these models with some uniform level of formalism, which sometimes goes well beyond what the original authors have done. And it's nice to see some puns, like for instance this one on Maxwell, where Poincaré writes <clears throat> that his work, his ideas, manque de rigueur et même de clarté, so lack of rigor and even of clarity. And so he rewrites it, everything with mathematical formalism so that the, the ideas are properly laid down. So although Poincaré doesn't have oops, his own uh, model and theory to defend, uh, when he describes the theories of the others, of course, he, he says explicitly where he agrees and where he doesn't agree. He doesn't hesitate to criticize uh, some of these models so we can get through the book what actually Poincaré was thinking at the time. <clears throat> so the book is on origins, which means a little bit on everything. So the first part is on the origin of the solar system and the planets. And then it goes to discuss the interior of the planets, the origin of the heat uh, inside the stars and the planets, the origin of stars and the origin of stellar clusters, and even at the end, uh, something towards the galaxy. So because I'm a planetary scientist and I work in planet formation theories, I'm biased. And so here I will only describe uh, the first part of the book where Poincaré discusses about the models for the origin of the solar system. <clears throat> so the basic observations from which the astronomers at the time were starting from was that the eight planets of the solar system orbit the sun all in the same direction. And its direction is the same as the direction of rotation of the sun. <clears throat> so the orbits are all prograde. The orbits of the planets of the solar system are basically circular. And they are basically coplanar. And so these uh, three facts, the, the prograde uh, orbital rotation, the coplanarity and circularity, suggested that maybe these planets formed from a flat circular structure like a disk. And uh, <clears throat> of course, astronomers knew, for instance, uh, Saturn's rings from very early on. And uh, it's always said, even today, when you read the review papers and books, that the idea of the protoplanetary disk, the disk surrounding the sun from which the planets form, comes from Kant and Laplace. And so indeed, Poincaré devotes the first three chapters of the book to Kant and Laplace. So Kant, what did Kant think? Kant think, thought that at the beginning there was a, a nebula at rest, no rotation, basically uniform, and with some slight density fluctuations. And by gravity, the gas started to accumulate around one of these density fluctuations, reaching so higher and higher density there. And by coming together towards the center, the gas was colliding with each other. <clears throat> and these random collisions eventually gave to the nebula some rotation. This is, of course, wrong because there is angular momentum conservation. So if the nebula is at rest at the beginning, it should be at rest always. And there is no way that collisions, random collisions, gives a global rotational motion to the nebula. So this is a fatal flaw in the, the thought of Kant, which completely disqualifies Kant in the eyes of Poincaré, who is very, very critical, and writes sentences like this. No mathematician would ever buy this stuff. 
And uh, obviously, Kant is a philosopher. He doesn't belong to the mathematician club. It's not that very well respected. In just six pages, Poincaré closes the chapter and moves on. Well, that's very funny to read. Uh, Laplace, instead, is a totally different story. Laplace is a mathematician. He's highly respected by Poincaré. So is Poincaré a champion, Poincaré hero. And his theory is what clearly Poincaré likes the most. He describes it in two chapters, 60 pages total, so the most developed uh, description. And uh, he also proposes some amendments to Laplace theory, but always moves in the framework of Laplace ideas as a sort of mentor for him. And as we will see, actually, the original Laplace idea are quite different from a modern view. This was discovered for myself as well, because <clears throat> typically people say, oh, Laplace got it all. And actually, as we will see in a second, the, the ideas of Laplace are, are, are relatively different from the current ones. So what did Laplace think? Laplace theory <coughs> was based on <coughs> two assumptions. So that there is a nebula. Here represents spherical at the beginning. Here represented by this green circle. And this nebula has a central condensation whose boundary is here represented by this red circle. And there is a lot of mass here in the central condensation compared to the rest of the nebula. <coughs> this is the first assumption, central condensation. The second key assumption is that the nebula is rotating, because Laplace knew angular momentum conservation. By the way, Laplace did not know about the work of Kant. And uh, when he quotes some precursors of this idea, he quotes other people and not Kant at all. So the, <coughs> the, the, the second assumption is that the nebula is, ro is in rotation, and it's in a uniform rotation. So the rotational frequency is the same wherever you are from the spin axis. And this top plot here is on the same scale as the bottom drawing. So this is the radius. Zero is at the center of the central condensation. And one is the initial radius, of outer radius of the nebula. And the white line shows the frequency of rotation. As you can see, it's the same, wherever, whatever the radius, whatever the distance from the spin axis. And I also report for reference, because it will become important, this red curve, which is the centrifugal equilibrium. That means that if the rotation rate is that of the red curve, a particle is in orbit, because the gravitational force is counterbalanced by the centrifugal force. OK, so this is the start of uh, Laplace idea. And then Laplace imagined that the central condensation contracts because of its gravity. And by contracts, it spins up. That's, again, angular momentum conservation. For those who don't know, I don't know if anybody, somebody cannot know this, but angular momentum conservation is that uh, law so that, uh, for instance, when a skater spins with the arms open and then closes the arms, it spins faster. Okay. And so this is exactly the same thing. When the central condensation contracts, it's like for the skater to close the arms, so we start to spin faster. And so as you can see here, this rotation rate goes up compared to beginning. Beginning was here, and now it goes up. But it's instantaneously propagated by viscosity throughout the nebula. So not only the central condensation spins faster, but the entire nebula spins faster. That's key in, uh, in, in, in Laplace model that at any time, the nebula rotation rate is uniform. So then the central condensation contracts even further, so it spins up faster. And we reach a point where, at the extreme of the nebula, the rotational rate is exactly the centrifugal equilibrium rate. At this point, the outer surface of the nebula, which is an equipotential surface, uh, starts to be distorted. It's not a circle anymore. It starts to become ellipsoidal. As the central condensation contracts even further, Again, the accretion rate, the, the frequency rate goes up, and now it intersects the centrifugal equilibrium at some radius, which is smaller than 1. That means that the gas beyond this location is now at centrifugal equilibrium, is detached from the nebula, is in fact in orbit around the central condensation. The equipotential surface of the nebula now stops at this point where the centrifugal equilibrium starts. And all the gas that, so it becomes more con contracted. And all the gas that is now outside of this equipotential level has to slide along the equipotential level and come down on the plane. 
And as the central condensation contracts more and more, as you can see, this intersection point between the rotation rate and the centrifugal equilibrium curve moves inward and inward. That means that the surface of the nebula shrinks. This point moves to the center, and more and more gas is left in orbit beyond the limit of the nebula. And so you can continue like that, and you get the central condensation uh, more and more dense, which eventually forms the sun <coughs> and accumulates a lot of heat by contraction. And uh, the, the nebula becomes small, and the disk becomes extended. So this is basically the idea of Laplace that Poincaré describes in mathematical terms using these equipotential levels and equations for a rotating nebula and so on in a very, very clear way. So is this all? Is this the solution of the problem? <clears throat> no, because for, for Laplace and I think also for Poincaré, it was inconceivable that you can form a limited number of planets, eight planets, out of a uniform nebula. Why something uniform should give origin to a discrete set of objects. So Laplace and Poincaré were after an ad a different idea, that not to form a continuous homogeneous disk, but rather to form a set of rings with gaps in between rings, so that each ring would then give you origin to one planet, and so if you have eight rings, you get eight planets at the end. How to get these rings? Uh, the description, original description of Laplace is a little bit hand-waving. And so it's formalized in Poincaré's book, following actually uh, the formalization provided by Mr. Roche, which I'm trying to explain here. So the idea is like, at the beginning is like what I showed before for Poincaré, uh, for, for Laplace. So the nebula, the, the central condensation contracts. At some point, the rotational frequency becomes equal to the centrifugal equilibrium frequency at the border of the nebula. So the next step, the contraction of the central core, we start to form, we start to form the ring. Now, the idea is that when the ring forms and the gas outside of the equipotential surface slides down to go to the plane, then uh, there is the, the gas that is now at the surface uh, was inside the nebula before, and, uh, and now it's exposed for the first time to vacuum. Okay. So because it's exposed for the first time to vacuum, it's not blanketed by the gas that was originally uh, beyond it. Now it starts to irradiate heat away into the vacuum. And uh, by irradiating heat, it cools down. And of course, by cooling down, the pressure inside the nebula decreases. And the pressure is what keeps the nebula inflated. So by cooling down and decreasing the temperature, then the envelope of the nebula uh, shrinks. But when the envelope of the nebula shrinks, the free rotational frequency doesn't change, because they to the essentially the angular momentum of the entire nebula is due to the central condensation. And, and it's propagated to the entire nebula by friction, by viscosity. So even, a, even if uh, the nebula would like to speed up by shrinking, essentially it has to stay at the same rotation frequency of the central condensation. So this shrinking without changing the rotational frequency doesn't leave any gas behind. And that's how a gap is produced. Okay. And then the central condensation will keep contracting and when it contracts, it speeds up the whole thing. And so new gas is left behind beyond the new surface of, of, uh, of the nebula. But then new gas is exposed to vacuum, so it irradiates heat, decreases the pressure, the atmosphere of the nebula contracts again without changing the rotational frequency, which leaves behind another gap. And then the central condensation contracts, and this leaves behind gas in orbit, and then the nebula contracts, and it's another gap, and so on and so forth. This is really bright. But, <clears throat> and, uh, and so this forms a discrete number of rings, depending on how many times the nebula cools uh, relative to the central condensation shrinking. Uh, <clears throat> starting from the Titus Bode law that describes uh, geometrically the separation of the planets, Poincaré uh, even computed the times at which the atmosphere had to contract to leave behind the rings and gaps. 
And uh, he concluded that the times at which the atmosphere contracted had to increase with a geometric progression. So if uh, T0 is the time at which first the atmosphere progresses, uh, the atmosphere um, com compresses, uh, then uh, the next one, T1, uh, T2, will be 2 times T0, T3 will be 3 times T0, and so on and so forth. Uh, so in, one, in Laplace model, even in this variant to form the rings, as you have seen, it, it's crucial that the nebula is in uniform rotation, and that this uniform rotation is the rotation frequency of the central condensation. So for Laplace, the reason for that is viscosity, is friction, and uh, so the nebula is forced by friction to rotate like a rigid sphere, essentially. It cannot have any shearing, because shearing uh, uh, exerts friction. Now, Poincaré in his chapter mentions that Helmholtz <coughs> computed that if one uses for the nebula the same kind of molecular viscosity that characterizes the atmosphere of the Earth, uh, it would take something like 10 to the 22 years for a nebula extended up to Saturn, to Neptune, sorry, to acquire a uniform rotation rate, which is the rotation rate of the Sun. So this is sort of enormous number. And uh, so Poincaré says that, but for him, is not really a fatal stop to the theory. Essentially, he thinks, well, then probably there is some other mechanism to make the uniform, the nebula rotating uniformly, because this is really required in order to form the disk and the rings. And in this, so the fact that Poincaré, in some sense, ignores this problem is actually very modern, because we still have this problem today. Now we observe uh, protoplanetary disks. And we observe uh, even the accretion of material onto the stars that we can measure. And so from uh, uh, these two observations, one can deduce the viscosity in, uh, in these disks. And the viscosity in the protoplanetary disks is many, many, many orders of magnitude larger than the molecular viscosities. And so uh, we still have this discrepancy of time scale, even today in modern times. And the solution of astronomers has been to invent a concept of turbulent viscosity. So it's not molecular viscosity that actually drives the evolution of the disk. It's this turbulent viscosity due to the turbulence in the gas. The viscosity is very, very enhanced, but it's still a very open subject of research to understand what generates turbulence and what actually actual viscosity turbulence can generate. So this is an open problem even today and doesn't stop us from believing in accretional disks. And so it's very conceivable that for Poincaré it was about the same. Um, so <clears throat> as uh, I think you have understood, the Laplace idea in particular <clears throat> is very different from the modern idea of a protoplanetary disk. And actually there was some, someone <clears throat> not very known in the history of science to the Visconti de Ligondé, to which Poincaré devotes chapter 5 and pretty developed chapter of 33 pages who actually imagined the formation of a protoplanetary disk in a much, much more modern way <coughs> compared to Laplace, and actually went very, very close to what we think <coughs> today is happening. So, and it's curious that this, this person has essentially disappeared from the history of science. So, for instance, if you do a search on Wikipedia of all the names I'm quoting, this is the only one that doesn't have a page. Of his own. <clears throat> so, and I really found, found out about this person reading Poincare book. So that's very interesting. So Ligondé said that, okay, initially think, starting <clears throat> thinking that at the beginning the nebula is a uniform rotation, doesn't look like very realistic, but probably a very rarefied nebula, it's just random motion in the gas. But if you do the sum of all the velocities, at some, you will get some total angular momentum which would not be exactly zero. Why should it be zero? Zero is a very specific number. It would be a very non-generic number to get. So the nebula, despite it's chaotically moving in all directions, has some non-zero angular momentum. Due to the inelastic collisions of gas particles, and uh, <coughs> that was also a concept that he introduced, the, the, the molecules lose energy. And by losing energy, they fall towards the center of the nebula and starting to form a central condensation. This is not exactly right. The reality is a little bit more complicated because when two molecules collide, they lose energy, so they emit photons. But these photons can be reabsorbed by other molecules which are accelerated. 
So actually, in a modern concept, we should worry about gas opacity and optical depth. But okay, the idea is about, is, is about right if you think that the nebula is optically thin. And uh, so by the gas falling to the center, uh, by angular momentum conservation, it starts to speed up. Also, this nebula, uh, because of these inelastic collisions, has to become flatter and flatter and damp on a plane orthogonal to the total angular momentum of the system. And this is uh, easy to, to understand. By the, this is the angular momentum vector, and this is the orthogonal plane. By definition of angular momentum of orthogonal plane, it means that if you take all the velocities of all the molecules to, uh, along the z direction, the arithmetical sum of all these velocities is zero. And so by colliding and damping the, velo the velocities within elastic collisions, of course, the z component of the velocities decreases, decreases, decreases until it becomes zero, which means that the nebula becomes flat on the plane orthogonal to the angular momentum. So by this concept of uh, uh, inelastic collisions, Ligonde could explain from an originally rarefied chaotic nebula the formation of the central condensation, which eventually uh, forms the sun, the formation of the flat structure around it, everything conserving angular momentum. And then again, that was the issue of why, how to form eight planets out of a disk. And uh, Ligonde thought that rings form, but rings form because of sort of gravitational instability, not because of this game of uh, cooling and contraction that I showed before from Laplace. And this is actually extremely modern. What I'm a little bit surprised about is that Poincaré describes all these ideas, does not criticize all of them, because I think it cannot be criticized, but is not particularly enthusiastic by that. It presents this like a model among others, and maybe sentimentally is more, still more attached to Laplace uniformly rotating nebula and ring model Maybe because it's more mathematically defined and you can do more, you can really write equations to describe the, the evolution of the nebula in Laplace model. And these equations are those from which I did the movies before, the animation before. Whereas this is more qualitative, you know. And so in the chapter from five, most of the chapter is devoted to dynamics of uh, uh, a, a medium where collisions are inelastic and comparing the evolution, so the contraction to the conservation of entropy and uh, to what the conservation of entropy predicts. Okay, so <clears throat> what we know now about protoplanetary disks before going to the formation of the planets? Well, disks exist. And now we can see with the most powerful telescopes, stars form forming in the star forming regions, and the young stars are all surrounded by protoplanetary disks. Some disks are seen phase on. And so they appear like uh, re uh, dark circles on a bright background, which is the giant molecular cloud, which is ionized and bright. Other disks are seen from the side, so they appear like a, a black uh, uh, horizontal band uh, over, again, a, a, bright, a bright background. Some disks are bright themselves because they are going, undergoing photoevaporation, so they are uh, highly ionized. Uh, so it's quite amazing that actually Basically, the idea of the protoplanetary disk is right, and that the people from Laplace, even Kant, could just by imagination imagine something like that. Imagine that the star forms by central condensation, central accumulation of gas, so the basic lines are, are definitely correct, and we now have the proof. These are not models anymore. This is reality. On how the nebula actually contracts and uh, speeds up and forms a star and forms the disk. Things are a little bit different, certainly the more the much different from what Laplace envisioned, similar to what Ligonde envisioned. Now we can do this kind of calculations using numerical simulations. That was a numerical simulation made by Matthew Bate. So in this simulation, you will see the, the nebula forming. So the density is uh, uh, represented by this color scale. At the beginning, the density is very, very low, so it's all black. And uh, <clears throat> this image is on the plane orthogonal to the total angular momentum of the initial nebula. Okay, so the, the disk will be, will be flat on this. So let's see the movie. <clears throat> so the, the gas starts to go towards the center. That's why the density increases, increases. 
because of angular momentum con conservation, this thing at the center spins faster and faster until it becomes rotationally unstable. It develops a bar, and then this bar launches a spiral density waves. The spiral density waves uh, extract a transport angular momentum, and that's the reason for which new gas can still go and feed the star, and we can observe the gas being accreted by the star using Lyman alpha emission lines. And at the same time, a disk is formed due to the gas that still has too much angular momentum to go to the center. And if you wait longer and longer, most of the gas accretes eventually onto the central star by viscosity. <clears throat> so as you can see, there are no rings. And there is also no uniform rotation, really, except at the very beginning when the bulb forms. Now, let's go back to Laplace's idea of the rings, because this is what Poincaré uh, buys. And let's see how the planet could form. <clears throat> the idea is that uh, the planet, uh, this, uh, with the gas cooling, the, oops, sorry. With the gas cooling, these rings contract more, both radially and vertically, so that the density increases and eventually a planet is formed. And uh, in Laplace, he doesn't question himself of why one ring should give one object and not several on this, the same orbit. Uh, this is something that Poincaré details and, and Laplace didn't. Now, the idea that the disk, um, by cooling down, becomes narrower and narrower is actually wrong. Because we know now that if one takes into account the viscosity of the gas, then actually you have viscous spreading, not Contraction. So this idea that this contracts radially is unfortunately not correct. The big issue of the time was to understand not really why a planet forms, because that was considered uh, conceivable if the density becomes high enough, but why the planets have a prograde rotation. This was a key question at the time. And for Laplace, again, friction tends to make uniform the angular velocity of the ring. For Kepler, for Kepler laws, the angular velocity of the inner part of the ring is larger than the angular velocity of the outer part of the ring. But because of friction, eventually these two rotational velocities have to become the same, like in the original rota uniform rotation rate of the nebula. And when the two rotation, angular rotation rates are the same, the linear velocity is, of course, larger here than here, because the radius is larger. And so the planet that eventually forms by this uniformly rotating gas will have a prograde rotation because the outer velocity is larger than the inner velocity. It will actually be synchronous relative to the sun. So we'll have one rotation in one orbital period, but the synchronous rotation is indeed a prograde rotation. So <clears throat> this is the only idea of Laplace that Poincaré criticizes explicitly, saying l'explication de Laplace it's insufficient. The explanation of Laplace is insufficient. And the reason is that <clears throat> Laplace didn't know this, but Poincaré knows this after the work of Maxwell, which was not clear and, uh, and not rigorous, but that he wrote it again, that if a disk has a density which is large enough, larger than this quantity, where omega is the rotational frequency of the disk, then the disk becomes unstable, gravitationally unstable. And so it has to clump and form self-gravitating clumps of gas. <clears throat> and also not form just a unique planet, but a number of, uh, of self-gravitating clouds of gas. Now, modern astronomers use this criterion, which is called Tumri's criterion for gravitational instability. And when you read books, uh, the Tumri criterion is given like this. So it's not the volume density, it's the surface density that has to be bigger than omega. Cs is the sound speed. But actually, if one thinks about the sound speed is the product between omega and the scale height of the disk. And sigma divided by the scale height of the disk is just two times the density. So if you do the transformation, you find exactly the same thing. So the modern celebrated Tumray's criterion actually was, was worked out well before by Maxwell. So because of this, then, uh, as I said, the ring will not become uh, infinitely thin and infinitely narrow and form, uh, to form only one planet, unlike Laplace envisioned. It will eventually start to break down 
in a self-gravitating sphere of gas. And so you will have several self-gravitating spheres of gas on similar orbits, but not quite identical. And because the inner guy, the inner self-gravitating sphere of gas, will orbit faster than the outer self-gravitating sphere of gas, when these things will collide, they will merge, forming eventually one unique planet. But because the inner ones orbit always faster than the outer ones, the final planet will turn like this, not like this. So a planet formed by this mechanism should always have a retrograde rotation and not a prograde rotation, unlike what is observed. So this issue of the prograde rotation was the real big question of the time. But first, before going further and see the explanation for the prograde rotation, let me review the observations of the time. What did the people believe? So for the astronomers of the time, they thought that all the internal, in the inner planets are all prograde, including Venus, That's, uh, which is retrograde. And uh, probably because Venus is a quite uniform atmosphere, they couldn't observe the clouds, and, uh, and so they could not figure out Venus was right. Okay, so all the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn were all prograde. But then they be believed that Uranus and Neptune are retrograde. Now, Uranus, in reality, is, the spin axis is essentially horizontal. The obliquity of Uranus is 98 degrees. Technically, it's retrograde but not really spin down like Venus. <clears throat> but Poincaré never mentions that, actually. So he considers it a, like a retrograde planet. Neptune, in reality, is perfectly prograde. But uh, why the, the astronomers thought it was retrograde at the time? Because the surface of Neptune is very uniform, so you can't detect any rotation just by looking at Neptune. But in, 1890, in 1846, the major satellite of Neptune, Triton, was discovered. A Triton is a retrograde satellite. Uh, it turns in a retrograde, in, a, in the opposite direction relative to the spin of Neptune. And at the time, uh, the, the astronomers knew that all the major satellites of the giant planet, Jupiter and Saturn, orbit the planet in the same direction of the spin of the planet. So for Neptune, they could not measure the spin of the planet, but they could measure the orbit of Triton. And by analogy, if Triton turns Clockwise, they thought that Neptune was turning clockwise too, so in a retrograde direction. And so this thing, first six planets are prograde, the last two are retrograde, is very, very important in the conceptions of the theories of the time. So the first explanation of why the planets are uh, prograde, uh, have a prograde rotation comes from Phi, who actually was uh, the director of the Institut de Mécanique Celeste here in Paris. And Phi proposed that the planets form still inside the nebula, when the nebula is, is still uniform, before it develops the central condensation. Why? Because if you, if, if, you have, if you are inside a uniform sphere of material, then the orbital speed, instead of decreasing like one over square root of r, increases like r. And so that means that in this scheme, the outer planet, the outer self-gravitating sphere of gas, orbits faster than the inner one. And so upon merging, this will give a, a unique planet on a prograde rotation. And so the central condensation and the formation of the star has to occur later, after planet formation, at least after that uh, uh, Jupiter and the other planets form. So Poincaré dismisses this idea as crazy because uh, when the central condensation forms, that means that the mass inside the orbit of a planet increases enormously. And if you increase the mass of, uh, that attracts, that changes the gravity that the planet feels, then the orbit of the planet migrates inwards. And so Poincaré computed with an easy math that in Phi's theory, the Earth should have formed at 13 AU. The AU is the current distance between the, Earth, the Sun and the, and the Earth. So 13 times further than the Earth actually is now, and Saturn 22 times further. And Saturn now is at 9 AU. And he considered this crazy, of course. So this is the reason for dismissing phi theory in, uh, in Poincaré's book, chapter 4. There is actually a, a positive side in phi's uh, theory that Poincaré mentions, is that in a phi's model, the planets form before the sun. And this was appealing because at the time, the age of the sun evaluated from cooling times was only 100 million years. 
But the geologists, by looking at sediments and fossils and so on, had deduced that the Earth at least had 200 million years. So the Earth looked older than the Sun, and this theory would explain why. But Poincaré doesn't really believe any of this dating. Radioactivity was being discovered. It was obvious that anything about heating and generational heating and cooling was going to change. So he thinks this is all uh, nothing to think about. So, and this argument is much more solid. So Phi is disqualified. So the idea of Poincaré, the solution of Poincaré, and this is really his own solution. Actually, it's written in the book. This is my thought. And uh, for uh, the progress of rotation of the planet is based on tides. The theory of tides was very well developed in those years by this person, George Darwin, who was the son of Charles Darwin, also died 100 years ago. And a really great man who understood a lot of things, in particular on the evolution of the moon and the origin of the moon. And his ideas are now being uh, reconsidered more and more. So uh, then Poincaré says, OK, tides are important. And tides are particularly extremely efficient when the protoplanet is still an extended sphere of gas. For these are the tides exerted by the sun on the planet. So the planets form like hot and extended clouds of gas. They are retrograde because of the way they form. But they are very affected by the tides. And as George Darwin showed, the tides have the effect of slowing down the retrograde rotation of the planet until it is synchronous, so that it has one sp spin in one orbit. But the synchronous rotation is actually a progress rotation. Right? And then the cloud, the, pro the cloud that is the precursor of the planet, contracts because it cools down. And this has two effects. First, it uh, frees the planet from the tidal grip, because the more, the narrower is the planet, the less sensitive it is to the tides raised by the sun. So eventually, the tides from the sun weakens, and the planet can become asynchronous. And also, by contraction, due to angular momentum conservation, I understood it, it speeds up. So the, the rotation frequency will become faster and faster, so it will be asynchronous. But because it starts from a synchronous rotation, which is prograde, it will be a fast and prograde rotation. This is very clear. Uh, Poincaré brings uh, forward three observational evidences for this theory being right. So the first one is that uh, the inner planets, the first six, are prograde, and the last two are retrograde. And Poincaré says, great, this is because tides become weaker and weaker with the distance from the sun. So Uranus and Neptune felt tides which were too weak to ever become synchronous. And so the reason to turn from retrograde to progress has something to do with uh, uh, something that has to become more and more prominent with the distance, decreasing distance from the star, from the sun, exactly like tides do. Then the fact that the satellites of the planets have orbit, have prograde orbits. So they spin around the planet in the same direction of the rotation of the planet. Of course, Laplace and Poincaré and everybody thought that the formation of the satellite is a, just repeats the same process as the formation of the planets around, uh, around the sun. And when the planet contracts, it leaves behind the disk, and from this disk, the satellites form, and of course, the disk around the planet has to turn in the same direction of the rotation of the planet. But the most distant satellites are actually retrograde. And Poincaré says this on the basis of one observation, which is Phoebe. Phoebe was discovered in 1899. It's the biggest irregular satellite of Saturn. We call irregular satellites the satellites that, instead of having a coplanar circular orbits, have eccentric inclined orbits. And some of them are retrograde. And Phoebe, the biggest one, has a retrograde orbit. And it is the most distant. The irregular satellites are much, much more distant than the regular satellites, which are very close to the planet. So Poincaré says, great. This is the proof that the most distant satellite formed early when the planet was still retrograde, okay, before becoming synchronous and before becoming prograde. And so this sequence, the outer satellites are retrograde, the inner satellites are prograde, is the proof that the planets form retrograde, and then eventually they are turned into prograde. <coughs> OK, what do we know today about planet formation? Actually, the idea that uh, Poincaré and the others were after is actually very similar to one modern concept of planet formation, which is gravitational instability. 
a mechanism for planet formation which has been resurrected by the works of Cameron or Alan Boss and others. So uh, this, there is this criterion, this gravitational instability criterion, that says that when the density is bigger than the rotation frequency squared, then uh, the disk is gravitationally unstable. So in the outer part of the disk, where omega is small, indeed, a disk can fragment in self-gravitating clumps of gas. But these clumps typically are very massive, much more massive than Jupiter. And this happens only far away when omega is small. Actually, what people at the time of Poincaré did not understand is that it's not enough to wait long time so that the disk becomes thinner and thinner and rho increases so that eventually rho can be larger than the rotational frequency wherever, whatever is the rotational frequency, so at any distance from the star. The reason is that the major source of heating in the disk is viscous heating, and that depends on the density itself. So you can't increase arbitrarily the density without increasing in turn the heating, which makes the disk thicker and decreases the density. So the density cannot become arbitrarily large in the disk, but it's self-regulated by the viscosity, so this relationship can only be true farther out in the disk when omega is small. And uh, so the theory of planet formation by gravitational instability actually seems to work, but predates only very massive planets very far, very far away from the star. We might see these kind of planets. Uh, for instance, the system HR8799, which is a system imaged with telescopes, uh, show this. So this is the central star, which has been uh, uh, canceled using uh, modern uh, coronography techniques. And the star is surrounded by three planets. The masses are not very well known, but from their brightness, it's about from 5 to 10 Jupiter masses. And they are very far away, 24 AU, 38 AU, 68 AU from the central star. I remind you that Jupiter is at 5 and Saturn is at 9. So it can work, but for other worlds, not really ours. For our solar system, we think things are different. And the modern concept of planet formation envision, of course, a protoplanetary disk, but consider the parallel evolution of the gas and the dust and the solid component. So inside the gas component, there is the solid component that sediments in the midplane of the disk. The inner part is dominated by rocks because it's hot. The outer part is dominated by ices because the temperature is low. And then the solids accrete with each other forming solid bodies which are bigger and bigger. And eventually, if a solid body becomes massive enough and there is still gas around, then it can start to attract the gas and form the gaseous atmospheres that characterize the giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn. So these curves are from Pollux model. So this is the mass of the solid component of the planet, which increases up to about 10 Earth masses. And then once 10 Earth masses are reached, the planet starts to attract the gas, so this is the total mass of the planet, gas plus solid, so the difference is the total mass, amount of mass in gas, and this eventually goes into a runaway accretion fashion, and a planet of hundreds of Earth masses like Saturn and Jupiter can be formed. In this model, so first formation of the solid core and then accretion of the gas, the prograde rotation of the planet is no mystery. It's enough to look at the dynamics of the gas in the vicinity of the, center, the core of the planet. So this is the direction to the sun, this is the orbital direction of the planet, and this is the straight, these are the streamlines of the gas. So you can see the gas comes in like this and turns like this. Something you can easily understand by solving the equations of the heat problem. And so the accretion of the gas necessarily gives to the gaseous planet a prograde rotation. For the terrestrial planets, it's a little bit different because there is no gas. And uh, the rotation of the terrestrial planets is due to the collisions between the rocky bodies. And, and because the rocky bodies can become eccentric, actually it's expected that the final rotation of the planet, terrestrial planets, is about random. So in Poincare books, actually, there is no mention of the physical differences between terrestrial planets and giant planets. And actually, people at the time thought that even Jupiter was solid. Jupiter was understood to be a gaseous planet, mostly gaseous planet, only in 1933. And they knew the differences in densities, but they just thought that these were differences in heat. And so there is no distinction that terrestrial planets and giant planets somehow must form differently or take two different evolutionary paths. 
There is no distinction between the dynamics of gas and solids. The idea is that everything forms like a cloud of gas, and then upon cooling, any gas eventually would become solid. Okay. And so there is no need, no discussion, the need about to remove eventually hydrogen and helium, because hydrogen and helium would never become solid at the conditions of temperature and pressure of the solar system. So to conclude, three uh, take-home lessons by reading this book. The first one is that science really evolves by standing on the shoulders of giants. Right? It's uh, quite impressive to see how these people like Laplace, Poincaré, and so on were the brightest minds at the time, were still relatively far from the modern concepts that we have. And uh, science has evolved, uh, astronomy, planetary science has evolved enormously since. And this is not because there was a super genius after Poincaré who revolutionized the entire field, it's just because of a community effort and piece after piece, brick after brick, the edifice has been built. And also a lot of observations have come in and planetary science is an observationally driven science, there is no doubt. The second one is a lesson of humility, of course. Even if because of this standing on the shoulders of giants and building an edifice brick after brick, by definition, I would say the modern models are the best models ever made in the history of science. Doesn't mean that they are good. It doesn't mean they are correct. We still have a lot of problems in understanding some things, and we are, we are aware of that. But I would even go further. Maybe something that we think we understand is not correct. Laplace fought to understand the origin of his rings, and of course, it was not correct. So it's probably the same thing. And, uh, and this, uh, given that I do planet formation models myself, I question myself what would be my models in 100 years from now. And I'm lucky if they can last 100 years, they will be eventually be looked at like naive and, and superficial, I'm sure of that. And the last take home message is that even the brightest minds can be misled by bogus observations. So this is a pun for our friends or enemies, the observers. But this is actually interesting. So I'm referring, of course, to the fact that Neptune was thought to be retrograde, and Venus was thought to be prograde, and Fide was thought to be a satellite like the others. And uh, uh, this is something actually we should keep in mind today, because with the discovery of extrasolar planets, we are bombarded by new data every day. And there is a tendency in the community to try to uh, write down and publish theories to explain the data as they come in, forgetting that these data are still very confusing, very partial, very dominated by observational biases, in some cases even wrong. And so we should learn these lessons. And uh, uh, I mean, a good theoretician should not start thinking until he really feels that the data are solid and robust. And of course, it's a skill to understand when this occurs, because if you wait too long, then everybody, the others do everything, and you have nothing else to do. So, but there is one thing on which Poincaré is really modern, and I would like to end on this, is this text, which is actually not in any chapter, it's in the introduction of the book that Poincaré wrote. And uh, it says this, which I translate in English, I can't read it anyway, it's too small. It says, Poincaré says that Laplace did not mention explicitly the possibility that other, of other planetary systems, but clearly, implicitly thought that they should exist and they should all be more or less the same because they come out of a universal formation process, which is the formation of the disk and the formation of the rings. And then Poincaré says that the recent progresses of stellar astronomy does not, don't allow us to still think the same. And because telescope has discovered such a diversity of stellar systems, of course, extrasolar planets did not, were not known, that we did not expect. And then Poincaré goes on saying, if the stellar systems are so diverse from each other, there are individual stars, double stars, triple stars, massive stars, dwarf stars, different temperature, different, there is no way the other planets will be like our own. The same kind of diversity that we see in stars will be also in the planetary systems. And this is, of course, perfectly right. In 1995, the first extrasolar planet has been discovered. Since we've found a thousand, there is a huge diversity of planetary system. This is shortly, shortly summarized in, in this diagram, which shows the distance from the central star and the eccentricity of all the giant planets discovered to date. And as you can see, 
giant planets can be at any distance from the sun, not just very far from, from the star, like our Jupiter and Saturn can have some, some have even orbits much, much smaller than that of Mercury. Some have circular orbits like our own planets, but others have very eccentric orbits like the comets in our solar system. And in terms of masses, everything has been discovered from 10 Jupiter masses down to one Earth masses with a continuous mass distribution. So really there is a huge diversity. Poincaré predicted it. It was totally forgotten and that's why astronomers were sort of, uh, uh, of shocked when this diversity of planetary systems came out from telescope surveys. But this is what Poincaré already expected. Thank you very much. Mm. This beautiful lecture and Shakespearean conclusion. So maybe there are questions. Yeah. Yes, please. Hello. Thank you very much for this lecture. It was extremely interesting. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, the man magneto hydrodynamic aspect of this problem. Uh, the fundamental equation existed, uh, I mean, were derived about at the same period. And Poincaré doesn't mention any of these effects, no. right? Exactly. And uh, do you have any comments on that? Do you have? I think so. Of course, uh, uh, Maxwell equations uh, were known, but uh, the idea that uh, magneto rotational uh, magneto dynamics could give rise to turbulence and solve this problem of the viscosity is much, much, much more, much, much more modern. And I think they did not have really the, the tools at the time to, 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 to figure that out, maybe not even, uh, yeah, I mean, there was this realization that the molecular viscosity was not enough to keep the nebula uniform, but they did not really try to go further than that. So, but it's true. So when I said that we have the same problem today, and so the molecular viscosity is not the cause of viscosity of the disk. We think it's turbulent viscosity. Then the question is what gives origin to turbulence in the disk. And magnetorotational instability is considered by most of the people in the community today the main driver of turbulence in the disk, which uh, explains the viscosity that is indirectly observed by the stellar accretion rate. So, Alessandro, so, so thanks first for this uh, magnificent lecture because I had, I had the book for a while in my shelf and I've started to read it a little bit, but never dare to really go through and I, I should thank you for that. My question is, do you, did you look to um, what was the, the following of this book? Did it have any impact or not or was it totally forgotten? Did, did you look to that or...? Uh, not, not really, but my, my impression is that, so Laplace's ideas and remained in the community, certainly, right? And uh, at least the idea of, of the disk. And uh, things started to progress uh, on my, later when uh, star formation was uh, revisited and with the first uh, com computer simulations and so on. And this was in the 1950s, more or less. But the, the, the idea of, of the disk was never requested. So it's something that actually went into the common culture uh, of the astronomers at any time. And then uh, the fact that Jupiter is gaseous was discovered in 1933. And I think uh, boosted a little bit the idea that some planets at least can start form from the gas component. And also pointed out that there are two clearly different categories of planets in the solar system. And so everything has to be much more complex than, than what was explained at the time. So. And sorry, perhaps it's a stupid question, but what uh, for the asteroids belt? Uh, uh, I'm not sure, was it, uh, was it already discovered by this time? And if yes, uh, well, the asteroids are s small, so I'm not sure what did they think of them and what do we think of them now for their formation? 
Okay, so the, the first few asteroids that had been discovered in uh, 1901 uh, was the discovery of Ceres. So here we are in 1911, so I think 10-15 asteroids were known. Um, thinking if Poincaré ever mentions them. Uh, I think he mentions them in passing and uh, he says you know, they, there was this law, the Titus Bode law, describing the distance of the planets from the sun, and they had a gap. So the fact that they found four or five bodies at this place was considered like uh, well, the proof that something was there and probably exploded. Okay. And I think he mentions that in passing in the introduction and not in the chapters anymore. <clears throat> and now we believe that asteroids are more the leftover of planetary formation. They never formed the planet, probably because Jupiter formed earlier and disturbed the region, preventing further accretion in the region. So thank you again. Thank you.